Hey guys, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today I'm doing a lecture on 9-11 and uh, the things that caused it, and then briefly about the things that preceded it. And then tomorrow you will um, read about the wars that happened because of 9-11, which was in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, so I'd like you to go ahead and take notes on this, and we'll get into it. Okay. So I just want to start off by saying that 9-11 for people of my age, um, like my generation, it was really the defining event of our childhoods. I was 12 when it happened. Um, I was in middle school. I remember it very, very clearly. We literally watched it live on TV. Um, and it really changed everything. It changed the um, how our nation thought about itself. It made people feel unsafe and scared. Um, so it's really hard for me to verbalize uh, how exactly it affected American history because it is part of kind of like my psyche and my childhood and the way I view things. Um, in the same way that like for you guys, probably COVID-19 will be that defining event of your of your life um, or of your childhood or maybe even these um, protests and uprising over George Floyd and Black Lives Matter might be that kind of like thing where everything changed. So I just wanted to start off with that. So you have you kind of have a, the idea of really how significant this was um, and how personal it is to people of my age and probably your parents as well. I mean, if you ask them, they'll know where they were on 9-11, they'll remember it. Um, I think everyone who is conscious or, you know, alive during that time really remembers it very, very clearly and can remember the feelings where things changed. So, okay. So let's talk about the guy who caused 9-11, Osama bin Laden, there he is. So he was born in 1957 to a very wealthy Saudi Arabian family that had close connections to the Saudi royal family. And actually his father uh, was the um, owner of a construction company that basically rebuilt Saudi Arabia, including rebuilding Mecca and making it into the huge city and really holy monument that it is today. So he came from a very very wealthy, important, and influential family. And he was, uh, he inherited millions of dollars. He was very wealthy. He graduated from a leading university. He was very well educated. He spent time in Europe. He spent time in the U.S., right? Um, he was a very well educated and influential person. But as he got older, he became a follower of a very extreme sect of Islam called Wahhabism. Um, and they believe in a very strict and literal interpretation, interpretation of the Quran, as well as violent jihad, which is fighting uh, against people who don't believe in the version of Islam they believe in, including other Muslims. And that all non-Wahhabists, including Muslims who are not Wahhabists, are heathens and enemies. So he kind of fell, or he um, became part of this very extreme ideology. Um, and a good, uh, like, comparison to something you might be more familiar with is, like, the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, the people who, like, protest funerals and have, like, those horrible signs and stuff. Kind of that kind of extremist version of Christianity. It's kind of that kind of extremist version of Islam. So a pretty small, very extreme sect. Um, and at this point, he began to turn against the U.S. And as you read about yesterday, the thing that really set him off was that the U.S. had had troops in Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War. He saw this as a desecration of Islam um, because Saudi Arabia was the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad and it's the home to the very most important shrines in Islam, right, um, Mecca and Medina. He saw U.S. soldiers, and remember he thinks of U.S the U.S. as the enemy, um, as desecrating the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad. So that was one of the reasons uh, that he really began to turn against the U.S. was the first Gulf War and the fact that the Saudi royal family allowed the U.S. to use Saudi Arabia as a staging base for U.S. soldiers to move into Kuwait and Iraq. He was also extremely angry about U.S. support for Israel. Um, and it's uh, Israel's embargo against Iraq. He saw Iraq as kind of the like home of um, Middle Eastern and uh, Muslim uh, supremacy 
in the Middle East, and he saw Israel because Israel is a Jewish country as fighting against that. And so he hated the U.S. for the U.S.'s support of Israel as well. <clears throat> so he all around just wasn't happy with the U.S. So in 1998, he formed a terrorist network called Al-Qaeda, uh, which means the base in Arabic. And Al-Qaeda can be spelled a bunch of different ways because Arabic is a hard language to translate to English. So you might see it with like Q-A-I, um, you might see it with a K, like it's lots of different ways. Um, Al-Qaeda was based on violent jihad and literal interpretations of the Quran, as well as like a um, drive to kind of martyr yourself for um, Wahhabist Islam. Eventually, um, Al-Qaeda began to operate in over 40 countries, including the Middle East, uh, the U.S., and Africa as well. Um, and they had training camps um, largely in Afghanistan there during this time, but also probably in Pakistan, probably in Iraq, um, uh, et cetera. And really what Al-Qaeda was trying to do was to train people and educate people to attack the U.S., both on U.S. soil and other places that the U.S. was involved in. So they recruited people, uh, they financed training camps, they bought weapons, um, and they trained people in some of these like guerrilla and terrorist methods. And they began to attack U.S. places. So even before Al-Qaeda became an official like thing in 1998, um, terrorists funded by Osama bin Laden actually attacked the World Trade Center where the big attack on 9-11 would happen. And this was in 1993 where they actually drove a truck bomb into the garage of the World Trade Center and exploded it. You can see a picture of that here. Um, it didn't bring down the building like the 9-11 attacks did, but it did kill seven people and injured many more. And this kind of gets lost in like 9-11, which was a much bigger, more horrific event. Um, but this was a big deal that terrorists had managed to attack a major site in New York City. Uh, in 1996, terrorists bombed a military base in Saudi Arabia, a U.S. military base, and killed 19 soldiers. Um, uh, attacks continued throughout 1998 and into 2000. In 1998, they bombed U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania um, and killed more than 250 people. So this picture here is the bombing of the U.S. embassy in Kenya, um, including Kenyans and 12 Americans. And then probably most significantly was the attack on the USS Cole, a Navy ship, at a port in Yemen. And remember, Yemen is down at the bottom there of the Arabian Peninsula. It's right underneath Saudi Arabia. And they killed 17 U.S. sailors. So if you remember back to the Vietnam War, what kicked off the Vietnam War for um, President Johnson was the Gulf of Tonkin attack, where Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, um, ships attacked U.S. ships. And so that's kind of a very similar parallel is that Al-Qaeda attacked a U.S. ship. So a lot of people after the attack on the USS Cole were really angry that we, the U.S. didn't do anything uh, to work against Al-Qaeda. And a lot of people feel like that if we had done something at that point against Saudi Arabia or against the camps in Afghanistan, that maybe we could have stopped 9-11 from happening. Um, but this was really significant um, for that reason and also for the reason that um, the US, or Al Qaeda had managed to attack a US Navy ship, which is kind of considered like the avatar of US power elsewhere in the world. Okay, so then we get to September 11th, 2001. So these here, these two tall buildings, were the World Trade Center in New York City, um, and they were kind of the center of a lot of financial and um, industrial uh, um, businesses in New York City. Like hundreds of businesses were located in the Twin Towers, and they're huge, or they were huge, as you can see. So, and they were really important, like kind of monument in New York and really a symbol of the New York skyline. So um, that morning, uh, Al-Qaeda hijackers took over four airplanes leaving from Logan Airport in Boston and I believe New York LaGuardia in New York. 
At 8.45 a.m., the first plane crashed into the World Trade Center's North Tower. So that's what you're seeing here is the plane actually coming in and crashing into the tower. And at this point, people didn't know what was going on. They thought maybe it was an accident or like a pilot was drunk or had died or something like that. No one knew what was happening. Um, and so people were worried, right? But people didn't know that this was an attack. And then 9.03, so about 20 minutes after, a second plane struck the second World Trade Center tower. Um, and this happened live on television, right? So people were filming, there were news crews, this was all over the TV, like we were watching this at home. Um, our friend in New York had called us and told us to turn on the news. And like people saw this happen, the second plane fly into the tower um, live on television. And at that point, people knew that this was on purpose. Um, at the same time, uh, there were two other planes. The third plane crashed into the Pentagon, which is the home of uh, the Department of Defense and the headquarters for the US military in the US. Um, and so you can see here, they crashed into the Pentagon. And then at 10 a.m., the fourth plane crashed into a field outside of Pittsburgh, um, and passengers had attacked the hijackers and had brought down the plane. Everyone on the plane died, but it didn't hit anywhere else. Um, so that was really an act of bravery by those passengers. It was probably headed to the White House, um, but obviously we never know for sure where it was going to go. But the White House seems like kind of an obvious target, or maybe the U.S. Capitol, where Congress is, something like that. So at this point, the towers are burning, um, but no one thinks they're gonna fall. They're these huge, modern, state-of-the-art towers. And um, as I said, millions of people are watching this attack unfold live on television. And less than an hour later, the towers begin to collapse. Like literally just crumple, accordion crumple on television. Um, and there were still people in there. There were people, obviously people were evacuating, but there were people in there trying to get out. Um, and so these huge towers, symbol of New York, just collapse. Um, and then less than an hour later, the North Tower collapses. So within two hours of the attack, both of these World Trade Center towers were completely gone. Just gone, right? Nothing there. Rubble. So the effects of this were uh, the death of almost 3,000 civilians and rescue workers. And when you really think about it, not to like, you know, undercut their deaths or the sacrifice they made or stuff, but that's like a surprisingly low number considering the number of people, which was tens of thousands of people worked in the World Trade Centers and how large the buildings were um, and that they were in the center of New York. That number is very small. I remember people saying on that day that 50,000 people had died. Um, in New York City or something like that. Um, but yes, yeah, so 3,000 people lost their lives, 246 people on the plane, 2,606 people in the towers, 411 emergency workers that had gone in to evacuate people, and then 125 people at the Pentagon. Um, and so the only event that this compares to is Pearl Harbor. Whoops. Um, right, Pearl Harbor, again, a foreign country had attacked the U.S. on the U.S. soil at a time when the U.S. thought it was really invulnerable. Um, and thousands of people died during Pearl Harbor, less than 9-11, but again, kind of a similar thing where people never thought that this would happen. The U.S., we don't get attacked on our soil. That just doesn't happen, right? And all of a sudden we did, and for 9-11, it was in the heart of America, in the heart of New York City. Um, so really the shock of this was horrifying to people. Okay, so our response to this. So within three days, Congress voted to spend $40 billion on recovery, both rebuilding New York, helping people who had suffered in the attacks, and then on the military as well. And Al-Qaeda took responsibility. They basically came out and said, yes, we did this, and we did this to attack the U.S. And Osama bin Laden himself said, I gave money and helped organize 
these attacks, right? He took credit for this. So it was very clear. It was not a mystery who did this. Um, Al-Qaeda was very clear um, and happy that they were able to pull this off. So um, by within the next month, uh, the president at the time, George W. Bush, the second Bush, organized a war against the Taliban government in Afghanistan because it harbored the terrorists. And the Taliban were the government of Afghanistan who were also kind of an extremist version of Islam. Excuse me. Um, and they had funded and given money to Al-Qaeda and to the hijackers of the planes. Um, so basically at this point, the US said, no, you don't get to exist anymore. You don't get to continue to fund terrorists and we're gonna come take you down. So that was one primary objective of Afghanistan. And then the second was to find and capture Osama bin Laden who was hiding in Afghanistan. So October 7th, less than a month after the attacks, the U.S. began military operations in Afghanistan. Um, and really one of the primary goals was to capture and kill Osama bin Laden. And something that embarrassed America for 10 years was that we didn't manage to do that until uh, 2011 when we found him hiding in Pakistan and then he was executed by U.S. soldiers and his body was dumped in the ocean. And that was one of the major achievements of President Obama's administration, was that he managed to find and kill Osama bin Laden. Uh, and this, uh, the war against the Taliban and the war against Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan continued and continues until this day. Um, we're fighting in Afghanistan, less so now than we were even five years ago, but we are still fighting against Al-Qaeda, against a resurgence of the Taliban and other various insurgent and guerrilla groups in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan now qualifies as our longest war, longer than Vietnam, um, at 19 years now, although we are in the process of peace talks. So when Obama left the presidency, he had drawn down the troop presence in Afghanistan to a very low number. And then Trump came in, began peace talks, and then he paused them, and then he's begun them again. So we're still in peace talks, although there are still, there is still a small military presence in Afghanistan. Uh, and then this also led to uh, war in Iraq, which you'll read about tomorrow. Okay, so that's 9-11. Again, I want to reiterate how much 9-11 changed things. It changed the perspective that the U.S. had on the world. It led us into two wars, the war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, into millions of lives lost, millions of Afghanis, millions of Iraqis, um, thousands of U.S. soldiers, um, billions of dollars spent there. Um, it changed how Americans look at the world, um, the fear that we have uh, about living in America. Um, more superficially, it changed how we fly and how we travel, right? Um, and really, you know, it, it changed what America was about, right? It shifted our perspective from the end of the Cold War, we were the dominant superpower, to now we were under attack. Um, and that was really, really scary for a lot of people. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's hard to explain, um, but I do recommend maybe talking to your parents or, um, right, maybe uh, aunts and uncles or older cousins or something about that and really get their perspective on 9-11 because this is a chance to really talk about history to uh, people that remember it um, and question them about what they remember about it uh, and thought about it and how it really changed the world for them because I guarantee you that it changed how they thought about things. Uh, it really did. Okay. Um, there's a couple of video clips I would like you to watch if you're interested in um, seeing some of the effects of the plane attacks on the Twin Towers. Uh, so I'll link those um, on today's assignment. Okay, have a good day. I hope you're doing well, and I'll talk to you later.